Hello and welcome. Few names have represented the Palestinian people as visibly over the years as this woman. Known for her straight-talking, tough diplomacy, few would cross her when it comes to negotiating the rights of her people, particularly the women. This week on One on One, meet Palestinian politician and peace negotiator, Dr. Hanan Ashrawi. Political activism was in the blood, with her father, Daoud Mikhail, being a founder of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO. Her mother, Wadia Assad, was a devout Christian of Lebanese descent. While studying at the American University of Beirut, the Six-Day War broke out in 1967, leaving her stranded in Lebanon. But she finally got her PhD in the USA before returning to Ramallah in 1973. Ashrawi's political activism began early on, fighting for human rights, usually centered around the Palestinian cause, making her a leading figure and spokeswoman in peace talks and activities. Becoming one of the most visible Palestinians in the world, alongside the PLO leader Yasser Arafat, Hanan Ashrawi served as a member of the Palestinian Legislative Council from 1996 and became Minister of Higher Education for the Palestinian Authority, but resigned in 1998 in protest against political corruption and the handling of peace talks by Arafat. In spite of divisions among various factions, Dr. Hanan Ashrawi remains, for many, one of the most prominent and articulate voices for the Palestinian people. Dr. Ashrawi, great to talk with you. Thank you. It's good to be here, this. You're one of these people who uh, crosses seamlessly from one field to another, you know, academics, politics, diplomacy, and so on. How do you define what you do nowadays? What, what do you count yourself as doing? Well, I think of myself uh, essentially as, as an integrated whole and not just as a sum of my different roles or um, my different responsibilities. So I think of myself basically as a human being with a multidimensional mission. Basically, I'm a Palestinian, uh, I'm a, a woman, I'm... A, an activist and, and a humanist, more than being a politician. Uh, and at the same time, I feel that uh, quite often things are uh, thrust upon us rather than come as a result of a calm and deliberate choice. Well, how do you find being a woman in a, in a world that is particularly male? I mean, the Middle East is still obviously very male-dominated. Yeah. Well, our society is certainly very patriarchal, male-dominated, and... Uh, uh, quite often not gender sensitive, <laughs> so to speak. And it is a challenge. It is a challenge that, and, and a constant test. I've tried to, to face this uh, repeatedly with a positive attitude and not as the exception or as the lone voice or as the superwoman, but uh, rather within the context of uh, the women's movement and, of course, people who are enlightened and who are gender sensitive and who are working towards the empowerment of women and society as a whole. You, you have a sort of double whammy, as they say, because you also are a Christian in, which is a, in an area that's uh, predominantly uh, preoccupied with uh, Muslim politics, too. Well, yes, the, the religious labels uh, have emerged only recently, but historically Palestine has always been a pluralistic society with a sort of more tolerant, inclusive attitude. And Palestinians, we view ourselves as, as Christian Palestinians as uh, part of our very authentic identity and uh, culture and heritage and history of Palestine. So we are really an essential part of the Palestinian narrative, and we're not just a minority, you know. Tell me about uh, your childhood. Uh, you were born in, in a very different era. You were born in, uh, in what was Palestine under British mandate. So what yeah. do you remember of those childhood years? Well, I don't remember at all being born <laughs> under uh, the British mandate because um, my first memories are after the, the war and, and the establishment of the State of Israel and uh, the exile of most Palestinians, the refugee issue, and uh, our return to the West Bank. So it was a so you know, sort of tumultuous say, time, really? Yes, my first memories, no, were not tumultuous. My first memories were in the West Bank. Palestine uh, no longer existed. Israel was created, and uh, uh, the West Bank was sort of uh, with the Jordan at that time, as part of the Jordanian Kingdom. So um, it was my, my parents' legacy. It was my parents' problem. But my first memories, really, of, of real uh, conflict were, were when I went to college, when the 67 war took place, when the issue became my own problem rather than the previous generation's problem. Talking of the previous generation, 
your father, Daoud Mikhail, did actually, he was one of the founders of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, so he was, he was one of those who actually did really embrace that legacy. Well, he's one of those who worked for uh, a sort of uh, the national cause, but from a human and humanistic point of view, yes. And he was part of the people who also resisted uh, in 1948. So was it a natural legacy that his daughter would carry <laughs> on there? Uh, I guess so. He was a real humanist. He was somebody who was, he was a man of letters. He was quite well read uh, and intellectual, but at the same time with a deep sense of justice and with a sense of courage to, to stand up to issues of injustice and, and uh, uh, grievance and exclusion. But I don't know whether you inherit these things, whether you learn them, whether you absorb them. Uh, but let's say he provided us with uh, a context and with the courage, with the confidence to proceed. I read something very interesting. You said your parents came from two very different legacies, that your mother came from the lavender legacy and your father came from the jasmine <laughs> legacy. That's right. what, what did that, what, explain that to me. Well, Palestine is always known as, as having jasmine, and, and jasmine is a sort of one of the symbols of Palestine. And my father is a Palestinian, and he's close to the land. He comes from what we call a peasant legacy, and uh, uh, therefore this is his attachment to the land and to Palestine and so on. He called himself a peasant first and a doctor second. And my mother comes from a sort of, I call it a Victorian tradition. <laughs> Uh, within the Lebanese tradition more than Palestinian and she came to Palestine and she has this sort of very Victorian attitude of being proper and propriety and decorum and so on so we called her the lavender tradition and, and at the gate and we still have it of our family home you have on the right the lavender on the left the jasmine and these two come together your husband, Emil, is often described as being your sort of opposite, and that he's a very sort of laid-back character. He's non-academic. He's a musician, a drummer as well. He's an and, artist. And yes. a drummer, too, as well, and so I can sympathize. <laughs> so tell me how you met. It was an interesting story. Oh, well, we met. Uh, there are two stories, actually. Uh, the first time I saw him, he was with his band. He had a band uh, that was uh, putting together modern uh, music to Arabic lyrics. and. Uh, Later on, it became much more of a nationalistic band. And he was part also of a, a theater group. But I saw him on stage. He was a drummer of the band. And uh, he, he was quite noticeable, being in the background as a drummer, but quite noticeable as somebody who was very creative and very involved. And the second time, and the real time we met, was at home when I was going to be tried. Uh, I was uh, arrested by the Israelis, and uh, I was going to be tried on Christmas Day, and his brother was working with us at the university, and they were part of the same theater group as my sister and so on, so they all came to the house to show solidarity, and that's when we, we first met face to face. And you told him you'd seen him as a drummer, and it had been quite an emotional experience. I did, yes, yes. But it was inevitable that we would meet. We moved around the same, same group, same circles. Now, the, how has the, the, the family background you've experienced and your relationship with your husband and your diverse uh, backgrounds influenced the way you bring up your children, your daughters? Well, the most important thing is to uh, show them that they are really loved, genuinely loved, and that they are really respected, no matter how young or old they are, and that uh, they can always talk to us and turn to us. And of course, we tried not to indoctrinate them in any way, but to give them uh, the essential values, again, that we were raised with, the humanity, the sense of acceptance of the other, but also the courage to try to uh, explore, to reach out, to uh, not to be intimidated. Of course, the, the, the part of the world you come from has been such a turbulent area for so long. You obviously went through some of the early stages and have witnessed, I mean, goodness knows what, but have your daughters also had any parallel experiences? I mean, you yourself, as you said, you were in, affected in 67, in June mm -hmm. 67, when the Six Day War broke out. You were actually banned from going back home yeah, to Ramallah because home, of yeah. a new Israeli law. And then you couldn't go back for six years, you know, back in uh, September 73, I think, when the yeah. Yom Kippur War was about to start. So, <laughs> so you timed it well. But um, <laughs> have they had any kind of parallel experiences like that that define them? Well, I don't know whether they define them, but both my daughters feel that they have lost their childhood, that they never had a childhood, even though we tried at home to provide them with the warmth and the security and the love and the affection that they need, the comfort. But at the same time, they were living in an environment that was extremely intrusive and very painful. 
uh, totally unpredictable. We, we couldn't do the normal things that, let's say, mothers and daughters do. We couldn't go shopping together. I couldn't take them to amusement parks. There were no movie houses. Nothing was available. And uh, they were traumatized by the fact that there was so much insecurity and violence around. Uh, we'd go down the street once or twice. They were tear gassed. There was a lot of shooting. Most of the time, there was curfew. We couldn't uh, go out of the house. The schools were closed down. You yourself, I mean, you're a viable target for a lot of people because of your prominence, you know. Yeah, well, that's one thing I always questioned, and I wrote about this in my book, is what right do I have to place their mother in jeopardy? That you may t take risks on your own as an individual, as a human being, but when you become a parent, then you're no longer your own person. So every time I took a risk, whether in protests or demonstrations or underground political work or whatever, I started thinking in a new way that these are my daughters who need a mother. They're not, I'm not just Hanan, an independent agent and mistress of my own fate, so to speak. So that, that was very, very difficult. And I couldn't really accept the fact that they were always so worried about me. Hanan Ashrawi, don't go away. We're going to take a short break here. We're back with more one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Hanan Ashrawi in just a moment.